Welcome back. Today is an exciting day. It's going to be our first in a series of visiting artist presentations. And we are joined today by Jana Arndt. Um, I just quickly wanted to introduce Jana to you before she takes over and tells you about her work a little bit today. So uh, Jana Arndt received her MFA in Studio Arts uh, with a concentration in electronic and time-based art here at Purdue University, actually just a year ago in 2019. Um, she's currently a visiting assistant professor in digital arts at the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture and Design at IU Bloomington. Her art and research interests include uh, variable technology, augmented reality, uh, activism, and feminism. And uh, she has truly uh, been you know, uh, exceptional in exhibiting her work and uh, publishing her work. So um, around the world, actually, she has uh, work included in the international symposiums on electronic uh, art in both 2019 and 2020 in uh, Guangzhou, South Korea, and Montreal, Canada, respectively. Uh, she has exhibited the Science Gallery in Melbourne, Australia, and the Science Gallery in Dublin, Ireland. And her work is also going to be featured in Into the Clouds, New Media Art 2021, uh, published by the Tsong Institute of Contemporary Art. So with that, I'm extremely happy to welcome back uh, Jana to Purdue University, albeit it's, it's virtually today, but nevertheless, it's great to have you back, Jana. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's it's hard to believe it's only been a year since I graduated because it feels like a thousand, especially now. Um, and also no time at all at the same time. Um, but yeah, so I he did a great job of introducing me. But just so you know, I'm, I'm Jana Arndt. I put a little phonetic spelling or pronunciation of my name in there because it looks like a bunch of consonants. Um, so yeah, I'm a native of Indiana. I'm from up north in the middle of nowhere. Um, I came to Purdue for a linguistics degree actually as my undergrad um, background with the intention of becoming a social justice lawyer and then uh, things changed and I ended up getting my MFA um, in electronic, electronic and time-based art um, and my world has kind of been turned upside down ever since. <laughs> so I've gotten to do all kinds of amazing things that I, I never would have dreamed of being from the middle of a cornfield. So I feel very privileged to be here and also to have my new um, assistant professorship here at IU, which is also crazy. So um, like Fabian said, I have uh, well, I have a lot of research interests, probably too many to be fair, but um, I'm really interested in the idea of tactical media and culture jamming. Um, so culture jamming, if you ever heard of that term, um, it's really about the use of media, um, particularly new medias, new technologies to, to disrupt or subvert media culture and um, mainstream cultural institutions. So I've been really interested in um, tech that we use in our everyday lives, in our households. Um, I have a Roomba project I'll talk about later on. Um, and then tactical media is this um, new media tradition that kind of started in the 90s, maybe a little bit earlier as well, but um, it's a form of media activism. So it's really taking a look at this idea of interventions or um, uh, actions as a mean of art creation. So um, one example, one classic example of a tactical media um, art team would be the Yes Men, if anybody has heard of them before. Um, so performing these different um, interventions, especially on TV or pranks um, on TV in order to make people question the media as well as um, poking fun at different corporations and such. So it's really thinking about how we can use the tools of the enemy, whoever that enemy might be, um, against them. So there's a really great book on tactical media um, by Rita Rayleigh. So uh, if you are interested in this, I just wanted to throw up a couple of these quotes to maybe pique your interest <laughs> in joining the tactical media team. Um, so in her book, she really discusses this idea of um, 
the history of these different consumer electronics that we kind of take for granted, you know, the Alexa, the Roomba, um, our smart fridges, uh, there was this revolution in consumer electronics um, that's kind of being exploited by those um, with the power and the knowledge in order to, you know, to exploit us or um, not necessarily in a nefarious way all of the time. It's just this hidden um, sense of knowledge of technology isn't necessarily ever present, you know, in the average person, average person's or user's brain. So I really enjoyed her quote. Um, it is not simply about reappropriating the instrument, but also about re-engineering semiotic systems and reflecting critically on institutions of power and control. So um, since I came from linguistics, I really liked this quote as well because I was really interested in semiotics, which is the study of symbols and signs and how we create meaning, um, not only with words, but also visually. And so I really liked this idea of tactical media being a way of re-engineering these different signs and symbols um, of these technological systems and hierarchies that we already have. So I'm also really interested in social aesthetics and um, different group art making practices as well. I do a lot of collaboration. I do more collaboration now than I think I, <laughs> I ever have. Um, so social aesthetics uh, really kind of spurred out of the um, feminist movement of like the 1960s, 1970s. It emphasizes the social and social art practice. So it's all about bringing people together and it's less about creating something um, traditionally aesthetically beautiful or um, uh, creating art and having one singular artist. It's more about like the group practice of bringing people together in order to make something. Um, I'm also really interested in this idea of the democratization of technology and media literacy. So I, I've been doing a lot of research within the field of glitch art and open source art as well. Um, and then yes, to tactical media. Um, so thinking about rejecting um, past art mediums or traditional art mediums, thinking about guerrilla art tactics um, and how I can, I don't know, subvert those different forms. So I'm gonna run through some of the work that I did in my MFA really quick. I'm not sure if you've seen some of these before already or not, um, but I'm gonna run through those quickly and then also talk about some stuff that I'm working on right now. So timely warning, I will give a trigger warning for this one. Um, it does deal with sexual assault and sexual violence on campus. So if that's something that bothers you, um, maybe just like turn your audio off for like three minutes. So Timely Warning was actually one of the first, um, well, it's one of the projects that I was working on during my thesis that I didn't know would be part of my thesis, actually. Um, it was just something that I was doing for myself, and then it slowly morphed into something more. Um, I kind of find that with a lot of my work, honestly. Even now, I, I start working on something for fun, like as a pet project, and then it kind of turns into its own, I don't know, monster, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so Timely Warning was a piece that I did um, throughout my undergrad degree and also my grad degree. So I was collecting all of those sexual assault timely warning emails that we were getting from the Purdue, um, uh, I don't even know who sends those out, the police department, I think the campus police department. Um, the campus is required by law to send out a um, a warning email and to avoid the gallery and alert students to the fact that sexual assaults have happened, you know, in a certain area, which is, um, I would say, <laughs> on the one hand, a net positive, right, because we are getting the word out and discussing these issues. But I also noticed um, and took issue with a lot of the words and um, the, um, I don't know, hidden semantic uh, meanings behind some of the way that things were phrased in these emails. And so I just started collecting them. I started doing it, I think, my senior year of um, undergrad, and then I stopped, and then I started again um, my first year of my MFA. 
So I started compiling this data because I was just saving them as screenshots on my computer. Um, and then just like kind of mapping out where all of these locations were that these sexual assaults were happening mm -hmm. on campus. And so that this is one of um, the maps that I used in my MFA show, mm -hmm. um, just kind of uh, showing where clusters of these emails were appearing. And then I started um, grading these emails based on their treatment of um, um, those affected by these sexual assaults, uh, the language used um, in order to describe not only these assaults, but also whose fault, who was at fault during these things. So there was a lot of um, suggestions in these emails about being assertive or, um, you know, not walking by yourself at night or utilizing you know, the safe walk program on campus, but it was a lot of what felt like um, victim blaming. And so that really bothered me. And so I just started grading these emails, giving them like letter grades like I would for my students, and then um, writing them little suggestions in the margins. And so this is a shot from my MFA show where I had got really, <laughs> got in huge trouble for painting this wall. Um, but uh, so I compiled some of these emails that I had graded into a scroll um, and then underneath it I had recorded myself walking. Um, it was kind of like a therapeutic practice um, as a victim of sexual assault myself um, to walk these different areas at night and just to experience what these places were actually like because a lot of them are places on campus that everyone should be, not that there aren't any locations on campus that women shouldn't be, but it was places like outside of the gym, um, at different dining halls, uh, at the McDonald's across from um, the engineering building. So it just was kind of the ther therapeutic practice of going out and recording myself walking these different um, paths. So here are some screenshots from the videos that I took of myself walking. So um, a lot of these areas, like I said, are well-populated, well-lit areas. And so a lot of the suggestions that they were giving in these emails weren't even pertinent to the situations that people were finding themselves in, which just added to my annoyance. So then um, also as part of my MFA and why I wanted to include this piece in this talk is because this kind of spurred the idea of getting started to make uh, different parts of my work, these uh, social um, activist workshops. So I had people come to my gallery show. I printed out these um, fabric prints of these emails. And then I showed um, one of these photographs is of another grad student um, from the photo department. But we all came together, regardless of our technological knowledge, and sewed some soft circuits in order to light up certain parts of these emails. And then I hung them outside um, at, at different locations on campus and they were promptly taken down. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a really great experience and this really got me interested in having conversations um, beyond the artwork. So we weren't really talking about like the technology or um, the, uh, I don't know, act of art making as much as we were just having these conversations about, um, you know, sexual assault on campus and different experiences throughout our lives. And so it was, it was really quite nice and touching um, to have this type of community space. So another piece from my MFA show was the Soapbox karaoke piece. Um, this was kind of my first uh, attempt at uh, tweaking some technology <laughs> to make it, um, I don't know, make sense to me as an activist piece. And I've actually had the opportunity to do this a couple times in Bloomington as well. And it's, it's always fun, regardless of if it's helpful or not. I don't know. But um, so the Soapbox Karaoke uh, piece is this 1990s karaoke machine. Um, I think it was manufactured, well, maybe it was 2000, I don't know, but it's got this CRTV screen. And I had to find a torrent of this ancient, out of date, um, uh, I don't even know, uh, CD burning um, software that would allow me to burn different CDs and create my own CDs for this 
um, system. So a lot of it was navigating this really outdated technology. Um, but essentially, I created a bunch of CDs with local um, and federal uh, issues that were up for debate at the time, especially in the Senate, and had people call their senators directly from this machine. And as they would um, talk to their senator, you can kind of see, so this one's for blocking coal lobbyists, um, Andrew Wheeler from the EPA, which didn't work, but um, <laughs> people tried. <laughs> so it gave people uh, the name of the senator that they were calling, um, and then also the phone number, so they would dial, and then it would give them like a prompt to read to the senator, which was great. So Patch is probably um, the project that really launched everything for me in, in my career that I have so far right now, which seems weird to say, uh, my baby career that I have. Um, so Patch uh, was this project I came up with um, where I was thinking about this idea of self-tracking technology and what it would mean to make um, a self-tracking technology that was for something that wasn't um, like health or fitness related, but was something about something I cared about. So I had this idea of creating a self tracker for different ethical behaviors that I was trying to like um, keep myself accountable for. I have a huge problem with guilt and feeling guilty all of the time about everything. Um, so I started using it to track my single use plastic. Um, it was something I was trying to curb at the time. Um, here in 2020, that's, it feels impossible to curb your single use plastic. Um, but yes, so I was really interested in a piece of technology that people could wear and use that is so antithetical to like a corporate wearable technology. So I had this idea of blending craftivism and textiles and DIY electronics all together. So this is the blurb um, that I sent in uh, for Isaiah where I got to present this work and also um, um, Melbourne and uh, Science Gallery in Dublin. Um, so like a Fitbit for your ethical performance, Patch is a textile based new media project that uses light and social media to allow the user to track their progress as an advocate for an environmental ethical stance. So um, I started creating these workshops for people to actually build their own wearable technologies. And depending on the gallery, I've done this uh, quite a few times now, actually. I've also done it um, in Dundee, Scotland as well. Um, at uh, Neon React Festival in Dundee. But uh, depending on the budget of the museum or uh, the activist group that I'm doing it with, uh, it has a bunch of different iterations, some of which I give people an ethical stance to follow, which isn't my favorite, or ones where they get to choose their own ethical stance to um, think about. But it's all about this idea of having these conversations while building these um, wearable technologies. So here's one of the ones, I think this is the one that I did um, in Melbourne, Australia. So this one, they were really interested in tracking um, CO2 in the air. So this wearable piece, you would track your own behavior by pressing the buttons on the microcontroller and the lights on the microcontroller either turn green or red based on your ethical behavior. Um, and then also there's a, SPG30 gas sensor on it that tracks um, CO2 and then also volatile chemicals in the air. So it was this, the idea behind it was to um, get people to not only think about their own behavior, but also the effect their behavior was having on the outside environment, um, which was really interesting because it was actually mostly women that showed up and the few men that we did have show up um, it was interesting to see that apparently um, there are people who study this, but the CO2 levels of the environments that women are in are often higher than that of men. Um, and this is pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, but apparently that's because um, women are exposed to more volatile chemicals and CO2 levels inside the home, um, doing things like cooking and cleaning 
um, and just being in a contained box <laughs> for most of the day, whereas um, men typically leave the home for work and to go outside, which seems really antiquated, but apparently these are still, um, you know, statistics that were that are happening right now. Um, but now we're all inside boxes, so who knows? But uh, <laughs> so these are some of the uh, different patches that people embroidered and made during this workshop. So we actually had 60 participants come, which was the most I think I've ever had <laughs> in one room. Uh, so this was at uh, Melbourne University with the Science Gallery of Melbourne. Uh, we had a lot of very talented embroiderers there but nobody had any coding or electronics knowledge. So it was really interesting and really fun because we had a lot of great conversations. Um, Melbourne is a very uh, green city, especially for Australia. So a lot of people were really passionate about it. Um, and then also I collaborated with a um, uh, designer who does uh, real-time data visualization inside processing, which I know you guys have been using in class. Um, so she actually created this uh, graphic that was projected in this big cube in University of Melbourne um, that actually showed each of the participants, um, their data was being live streamed onto this screen. So you can see kind of, it's a cell phone photo, sorry. But so the TVOC data is the volatile chemical uh, data. The red is the CO2 average. And then um, their daily pledge is them um, deciding how ethical they were. Um, so this one, like I said, was mostly about CO2. So people focused on um, how they were getting around the city. They had um, just opened up some more public transportation lines and also bike lanes in, in town. So it was a lot about um, different people's commutes, and then also um, how much time that they were spending idling in their cars because it was winter. Um, yeah, so it was really interesting to get all of this live data. So <laughs> onward to um, stuff that I'm working on right now. So this one is one of my uh, pieces from last year. So this is Make Floors Great Again. Um, so this is the Ruba piece that I was discussing. Um, so this is uh, Rupert Murdoch, my gilded uh, Roomba. And he uh, <laughs> um, only runs whenever Donald Trump tweets. So he not only starts a cleaning cycle when Donald Trump tweets, but he also sends him a thank you tweet each time uh, to his account. So this was kind of where I was really interested in hijacking these like everyday technologies. Um, and I have been working to actually create like a, a zine or a guide on how to do this because it's surprisingly easy. And I really enjoyed this idea of um, all of these powerful white men, especially for Twitter. I feel like, um, I forget what the statistics are, but um, the retweets and uh, likes numbers for, um, famous white men are like infinitely higher <laughs> than any other uh, population or marginalized person, um, which of course they are. But uh, I really liked this idea of taking the tweets of, you know, powerful men and using it to clean your apartment. Um, I don't know, there's something <laughs> that feels a little bit like justice in that for me, um, however small it is. Um, but yes, so that is one of the pieces that I've been working on. I was supposed to show it in South Korea <laughs> over the summer, but because of COVID, it ended up being a, um, a, a website performance piece. So I coded this uh, website that has a live stream and then also the live Donald Trump tweets. Um, so I was having showings of the Roomba actually cleaning my apartment every day. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately for my boyfriend, he loves tweeting at around 3 a.m. So it was a really long and horrible week <laughs> where we had to hear Donald Trump tweeting physically in our home uh, all the time. And then also I did get to show it before COVID um, in the gallery here on campus. Thank you, Trump. <laughs> So 
it was really actually fun and I can't wait to have this piece um, shown in a physical space again because I really enjoyed watching people interact with it because it was it had this really interesting um, uh, I don't know people interacted with it differently based on whether they thought it was a like physical embodiment of Trump or if it was a slave to him so there was either this like sympathy that they felt for it or this like hatred that they felt for it so like here you saw one of the other professors actually kicking it so she would just like kick it and stop it from um, performing its duty or some people um, it would actually die so he would tweet so much in one day that the battery on the Roomba would just give out because it couldn't find its home um, in time to uh, before he actually retweeted and it started uh, driving around again so I saw a lot of people take pity on it and actually carry it back to its home quite often, which was kind of cute and sad. Um, but yeah, he tweeted so often it actually ruined one of the wheels. So I've had to replace some of the wheels already. It's, I don't know, it's been wild. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, another piece that I've been working on recently. And then uh, other works in progress, briefly. Um, I've actually started revisiting another piece that I did during my MFA called Peeping Tom 2.0. So I was using, um, this was a, an installation, but I was using image targets that I had embroidered onto these underwear. Um, and you can see all of this on my website as well if you're interested. But um, essentially I was using these embroidery pieces as image targets for augmented reality. So I was playing video on top of these um, garments and um, I think we can see yeah so this is um, my roommate at the time <laughs> actually using the app um, that I made using unity and Vuforia uh, to play a video an edited video from Animal House uh, from this image target on this uh, set of underwear um, so I'm actually working in collaboration with Ji Young Shin who is another assistant professor here at um, the Eskenazi School of Art and Design. And uh, she's really interested in fashion and history. So I included this piece on the right-hand side of hers. She makes gorgeous, gorgeous work, whereas I am like very lo-fi, she is very high fashion. <laughs> and so it's been really interesting to collaborate with her, but um, we're interested in building um, in, the, in 2021 um, a series of augmented reality um, uh, inherently feminist, uh, I don't know, designs for t the year 2021, especially since, you know, even though Biden won, we still lost the Supreme Court seat. So there's a lot of fights, especially for um, any mar marginalized gender um, that need to be uh, at the forefront of our minds for the next four, well, probably 40 years, I don't know. Um, so yes, we're collaborating to make augmented designs, um, and she has a lot of uh, cultural history for women and different women's movements and fashion. Uh, the last piece that I was going to include quickly is hypothetically speaking. Um, so this is a text-based uh, text generator that uh, I actually stole a lot of the code from our old friend um, uh, from the coding train. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Dan Schiffen forever. Um, but so I'm actually working with another professor on campus. Um, this is still in its early days. Uh, I'm working with somebody from the uh, graphic design department. But we are feeding um, different uh, uh, redacted uh, government documents into this prediction-based text generator in order to create hypothetical sentences out of these different redacted texts. Um, so yeah, so I've got this one. I This one has been, I don't know, really interesting to me, which is the Mueller report and then also the Mueller hearings in the Senate. Uh, so I've been just, you know, hitting generate over and over and over again to see if I can um, get anything that hypothetically could have been redacted to show up. Um, obviously, the chances of that are extremely slim, but it's still fun to mess around with. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still playing around with how much of it I want to be um, clearly computer-generated and nonsensical, and how much of it I want to be 
um, as realistic or human feeling as possible. But I've also been feeding it like uh, uh, the recent redacted UFO information in there. <laughs> um, so I don't know. That's just something that we've been playing around with uh, recently. So that is, I think, all of my pieces so far. Um, I do have a website though, so if you're interested in taking a look at some of the other experiments that I've done throughout the years, you can also check out there. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much, Jenna. This was, this was brilliant. <laughs> um, I think we, we should just open it up for questions, see if there's any immediate responses or any, any questions from the rest of the class. Hey, Shane. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question. So I'm just wondering like why you um, or like how you decide to take like activism like really seriously in your art and like how you were able to like make that choice for yourself. Um, so I have always been very political. I think I was like that annoying sixth grader that couldn't vote, but was still like, I don't know, very anti-Bush at the time. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know, I guess um, I was really inspired. One of the first uh, gallery shows that I ever saw in my entire life, I think I was, I think I was 17. I went to Chicago and I saw the Yes Men at uh, Columbia College Chicago. Um, they had a couple of their pieces in this gallery, um, like the the Halliburton uh, Survivable, if anybody has seen that one, where it's like this um, hypothetical, it's supposed to be funny, uh, survival suit from Halliburton that they designed, and it just like blew my mind. <laughs> and so, I don't know, I don't know how I came to it. Um, I was thinking a lot more about uh, death and dying, I think, before uh, the 2016 elections. Um, but I've always been really uh, active in the activist scene, like um, at Purdue in West Lafayette. I was part of the Younger Women's Task Force, which is like a um, intersectional feminist group that does a lot of work in West Lafayette. Um, here I'm part of Hoosier Action, so that's um, a group here in Southern Indiana that uh, does a lot of activist stuff on the sun like with the sunrise movement which is like a, a climate change organization so i don't know it's always been really important to me so i guess i don't know that that's why thanks so much um well first off i really really liked your uh Roomba trump one i thought it was very funny um but how did you decide on this medium like what drew you to this type of activism and art um, well, so, uh, that's a great question too. Um, I think for me personally, like new media and, um, digital art as we call it here, um, really lends itself to this type of work. And there's actually a really rich history of activists, um, and artists using, um, any new media possible in order to create activist work. So like, um, man, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, um, there was, oh, who did Shredder, or like Jody, like really early web art pieces. Um, I'm so bad at artists' names. But um, yeah, there's just like a really rich history. So then as soon as I started doing any kind of research in this medium, I kind of realized it really lends itself well, because it, unlike, in my opinion, um, which might get me in trouble with other professors here in the art department, but in my opinion, um, digital art, uh, particularly like net art or like this type of like tactical gizmology or whatever they call it, um, where you're building these different types of electronics, uh, has a really low threshold as far as like the amount of money or the amount of knowledge that you need to do it. Um, it's really just a lot of Googling and there's this also this really rich vein of open source technology or people just sharing their knowledge freely um, that kind of lends itself to this type of activist work just because 
Um, anybody can do it if they choose to research it. Obviously, that's coming from a privileged position as well, just because I have the time um, to do this type of research. But uh, I think personally, it's um, outside of this white box gallery as well. So um, I don't know, it's always has, has this punk kind of attitude for me that I, I kind of appreciate. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I stumbled on it. And to piggyback onto that, so if you remember Cohen Wah's last uh, student artist research presentation, Institute for Applied Autonomy, for example, is exactly in that vein of work. Uh, Critical art, uh, critical art ensemble, for example, uh, Beatrice da Costa and so forth. So um, let, let me know if you want to research some more artists that, that use this technology in a more critical way. And I'm happy to supply any of you a, a, a list that you can just start looking up and uh, researching a little bit more. Yeah, there's so much like from net art, like completely digital stuff to like, creating different um, technologies like um, with the critical engineers group with news tweak if you remember that piece from like 2011 they like started hijacking local area networks and changing news without people knowing from like the bbc and stuff it was really awesome but yeah there's so much out there thank you jenna um, you mentioned uh, re-engineering semiotic system I just want to like um, see how you define this term, and uh, I'm wondering if you can address this uh, like idea in your works. Yeah, so um, I think that was the quote from that Rita Rayleigh book, the tactical media book. Um, so for me, like as far as especially in that quote, like I was really drawn to it mostly because. Um, we see um, these different signs and symbols of these different technological systems. So for instance, like with my Roomba piece, when I was thinking about it, um, I was taking this kind of um, clean box technology of this Roomba, right, which looks like something, um, especially if you don't have any electronics knowledge that you're not really supposed to tamper with. Like it's a, it's a sealed unit, right, of this like clean designed um, consumer technology. And so I was really thinking about how I could subvert that and make it, um, I don't know, do something that I that I found interesting or um, for instance, gilding it. Like I, I wanted this idea of making it tacky, like so it wasn't so untouchable anymore. Um, and as it runs as well, like it gets gouges in it and all kinds of like, it starts peeling off because it's just like this um, really thin gold leaf. So for me, yeah, it's all about like taking those different signs and symbols that we don't necessarily think about on a daily basis. Like if we think about the design of anything from Apple or Amazon, where it, it is like this really clean, I don't know, um, box that you're it, full of mysteries that you're not supposed to tamper with. And then just kind of like exploding that out and thinking about different ways that we could um, take that back, I guess, in a way, right? Um, even within like, uh, social media networks or um, the internet in general, um, so much is, is hidden in that code in the back end that we're not really supposed to look at or touch. And then thinking of ways that we can kind of like turn that around, like those old um, uh, web art pieces, like, man, I wish I could remember who did Shredder or Jody or something. <laughs> those like um, where they would take all of the code from the back end and make it visible and then take everything that you were supposed to see and put it behind and like kind of scramble up websites and stuff. Um, that's a lot of what like these different new media artists were doing then and I think it's still pertinent to do now. So um, I guess that's kind of how I, I see it. Thank you. Uh, Will, yes, you you wanted to say something? Yeah. That, um kind of made me uh, think about uh, sort of a difference in a lot of the old school style in which people, um, especially in America, would approach technology versus now. Um, you know, Back in the day, you know, your TV broke down, you called a TV repair person, they came, you know, there was a lot more longevity to tech versus now because everything is these sort of sealed box units, it's 
more of an easier, it's a dispo to some degree what we call, you know, disposable society. So it's, I, I, it's interesting to see that there's a lot of people, more uh, other people out there who like to do that tinker and like make a product their own, regardless of, you know, your warranty license or whatever, right? Um, be able to instead make this tool, which is what they're supposed to be, actually fulfill the task that you want it to, as opposed to this task that somebody else wants it to, allowing, you know, and that, that sort of allows a sense of freedom, which I, I kind of enjoy that whole string of thought. Yeah, well, there's like this programmed obsolescence that people talk about all the time, like, um, but I find it really interesting, especially if you look into like um, the history of the internet or, um, yeah, like I guess that's a really good example of like how um, it went from being something computer code and using computers was something that only you could do if you had like this really extensive knowledge and how they worked and you knew exactly what codes to punch in in order for it to do some some function right and then um we kind of started moving into like the consumer space but with that we had you know the development of um uh you know, these GUIs, right, our, our um, graphical user interfaces that hid all of that knowledge behind them. And so, I don't know, I just, I find it interesting, especially if you look into different glitch artists. Um, they talk a lot about this idea of um, uh, digital literacy and ways of just exposing people to like little bits of that like back end knowledge that get them interested in thinking about like, oh, like when I'm using a computer, I'm using it in the way that somebody designed it to be used for me. Like instead of thinking critically of like, oh, I could use this however I want it or in a completely different way. Um, but instead we have this like organized like folder system, desktop system. Um, yeah, instead of thinking about it uh, as it actually is, um, so on the one hand, it made it much easier for, you know, anybody to use, but at the same time, um, we kind of lost a lot of that, uh, understanding of the technology and made it feel really foreign. Um, so then when we have things, especially now, like with social media networks, um, so many people don't really understand what's actually happening, especially with their data. And that's become a huge problem as well. So like, I don't know, I'm really interested in, in exposing people into thinking more critically about how they're using this, these technologies and whether or not they're using them um, the way they're being told to use them or, you know, just thinking about different ways they could use them themselves. I think that's, uh, you, so you gave me another thought here. Uh, <laughs> Good. Yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, to some degree you could think about the sort of responsibility of this technological literacy and who, who that falls on and kind of ask the question of, is this a problem that is created by just the nature of technological development or by us, the consumers allowing it? For example, like the iPhone is very popular in the uh, US, for example, not as necessarily as popular um, overseas in different countries. Like there's different, different phone brands, for example, have different popularity in different countries based on different aspects. And one of those is um, usability, right? Uh, iPhones tend to be very simple user interface, easier to just pick up and go, whereas Androids tend to be a little bit more, a, a little bit more can do a computer and all that. And it's interesting to see what different people, based on either technological exposure or uh, cultural surroundings, what they'll pick, what they'll choose in tech, and how much do they choose to delve into these topics. And I wonder what is the cause for these different, you know, things. Because there's a context surrounding, I think that generates this this broader issue. I'm curious about it. Yeah, um, there is a really good. Oh man, maybe I should link it in the chat if anybody's interested. But um, there is a glitch artist named Nick uh, Brees who is in. He's operating in Chicago. Um, he talks a lot about. Well, he does a lot of like. This, the stuff that I'm interested in. So this idea of like democratizing these different types of technologies. He runs a lot of workshops about like creating net art and um, also glitch art. And so, but he's primarily known as a glitch artist, but he talks a lot about like the history of the internet and um, different paths that it could have taken if it had been 
um, take it over by different corporate interests than the ones that have it now. So it, it's very interesting. Um, so you might want to watch, he has like an entire web series on like the history of the internet, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to kind of process. And then I also think to myself, um, I don't know, because we divide ourselves into this idea of um, users and developers. And um, I don't know, I feel like that's kind of a toxic way of thinking, especially the more that we progress, because it feels like the cat's kind of out of the bag at this point. Like, I don't think there is going to be, especially post COVID, like who knows, but um, we're not going to get away from the internet anytime soon. So like, I feel that the more people that we can make this knowledge accessible to, um, the better. And I kind of view it as, um, uh, as traditional literacy, right? Because it's called digital literacy. Um, and it should be like an important part of um, continuing our freedom, which sounds like really like crazy and like, I don't know, like libertarian of me or something. But I just feel like um, we're being controlled so much by these technologies, as well as we're controlling them, but um, they're being more and more controlled by these large corporate interests. And because we don't necessarily understand how they're creating them or um, forcing us to use them, um, it's really easy to take advantage. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. That's that's why I find it most interesting. I have something to chime in on this topic. Is my mic working? Yeah. Yeah, I think part of this kind of comes and goes in waves because uh, like you had like the Apple II in I think it was the 80s. And that was like from what I can tell is like highly customizable. Um, and the user themselves could kind of click and add in different things. And then post that, uh, there kind of became the rise of like, I would say it started probably with uh, the first iPod where things started trying to be streamlined again to keep up with the media outlet of like MP3s. So then people were trying to design like the best uh, MP3 using device. And then that continued for a while, but I think like the 2010s in the middle of it with uh, the advancement in like video game and graphic technology, people were tempted to start building their own computers again. So I think it kind of comes and goes in waves. And the important thing is to realize that like at any time a company could try to like stiff arm the market or capture the market. And we should just be aware of that and make sure no one tries to like put the blindfold over our eyes. So we have the option to keep up with these kind of like conglomerates that make a streamlined device, but also ourselves know what's in it and be able to build our own devices too. Right. Well, and I think that's really true. Um, I think, especially with a lot of new media artists making work far more interesting and amazing than what I do, like there are people who are at the forefront of like pushing these different issues. I do think though, there is a lot of problem with um, um, the availability of this uh, knowledge and then also um, just the time and um, accessibility to this knowledge like even now teaching at um, you know IU which is a Big Ten University I have students who live out in the country who barely have internet access and like thinking about these different corporate systems and um, I guess not viewing it so much as like a trend in um, uh, user interface and also viewing it as like a corporate machine that is also just trying to profit so um, there's a really interesting history of uh, Xerox Park where they were first creating um, this graphical user interface as a way to make um, computers more accessible to more people and kind of democratizing the knowledge. So the idea was to have like the coding interface and also a graphical interface all on the same screen so that you could see the code, understand the code, and then also see what you were programming. And then um, when Mac kind of got, uh, <laughs> a hold of so Steve Jobs got a hold of like this type of technology like there's this story that he like visited Xerox Park saw what they were creating with this graphical user interface and decided to just use it as like the entire interface instead of um, showing that back end or that coding knowledge just completely graphical user interface because then he had control over like the system and who was using it and how they were using the computer so I think there's also corporate interests and money going into that and um, 
while I personally love to tinker with things, I also am viewing this as a white woman who is a professor at a university and I have the time and the money to do that. Like um, even somebody like my boyfriend who is a, a bartender, like he ain't got time to do any of that. You know, like he's working his 12 hour shifts. Um, so I think the idea of, um, you know, keeping up with this technology being on the users, I disagree. And I think it's more about pressuring these different corporate interests, particularly with um, the internet and these social media outlets, right? Like, what are we gonna do about that? Sure, I can build my own device, but if everything that I'm using on it is Adobe software and Facebook and Twitter, like, um, you know, there's larger problems there than just building your own device. Yeah, it's kind of tricky too because uh, a lot of these companies understandably so want to protect their hardware and software to prevent someone from like stealing it. Uh, but on the same respect, like I have a computer that's like eight years old and I want to try to fix it. And even now, eight years later, the blueprints for like the baseboard motherboard are still locked away. So I can't even fix a computer that I fully paid for because it, the access to these tools to understand it are hidden. Oh God, so that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a, there's another interesting question in the chat here from Brooke. Um, how did you find a career path that best suits your interests? And maybe just to piggyback onto that, I think you've made a very successful transition from you know, being a student, graduating from Purdue, immediately finding a job, being out there in the world, showing showing your, your work and exhibiting, right? So uh, do you have any advice for the students in this class? Maybe as a second part to your answer, any advice, any strategies, tips, how to make that transition successful? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I hate it because I feel like, um, uh, I don't know. I always feel like an imposter every day. So maybe that's one of the things is like, just like do it anyway, even if you feel like you're not qualified. Um, I don't know, do it anyway, it's fine, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, so as far as like transitioning, especially if most of you are undergrads, first of all, if you're interested in um, doing art for a living, and especially if you're like me and like the art that I make isn't necessarily something that somebody can buy, nor would I sell it because that would be against um, my ethics, I, I would go to grad school, <laughs> find yourself a grad program, find yourself a Fabian and a Shannon um, to lead you <laughs> into a, a new world. Um, but yeah, I would say also, um, and I can really only speak to, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing, which is, um, you know, uh, primarily doing a lot of workshops, um, uh, doing a lot of gallery exhibitions, just apply to everything any opportunity that you could find, <laughs> apply to it. I remember Fabian and Shannon both, uh, you know, not yelling at me, but firmly telling me to apply to things, even though I felt like I shouldn't or I wasn't good enough. Um, so just do it anyway. Uh, you will get rejected like a thousand million times and it sucks really bad. <laughs> um, so that hurts, but it's fine because then eventually someone will look at the exact same piece and they'll be like, oh my God, this is exactly what I've been looking for. So um, there's that. Uh, go to conferences, which is also really scary. Uh, meet a lot of people, which is also something I hate, but it's very good. <laughs> uh, um, let's see, what else? Things I wish I knew. Uh, get really good at writing, which isn't something that is fun necessarily for everyone, but if you're really good at writing about your work, even if your work um, to you doesn't seem that great, like if you're great at writing about it and have a really solid um, research foundation for like what it is that you're interested in doing, that will get you so much further than having something that is visually amazing, um, at least in this field. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess that would be, I make my students write artist statements um, every semester and they're always like <laughs> you made me write one last semester and I'm like do it again <laughs> fix it um yeah I don't know do the stuff that scares you really bad because I think that is usually um the stuff that you like to do or I don't know that's just me I'm scared every day <laughs> Oh, 
All right, I think we're at a good point here um, to close the official questions and answers. So thank you very much, Jenna, one more time for all your time, for your presentation, for you know spending a little bit longer afterwards and, and talking to, to all of us, answering our, our questions.